They had issued 1,000 casualties on our side. The Germans had about 100,000. Initially, when the Battle of the Bulge broke, at my level, we didn't know what was going on. All we knew was another fight. It's some time later we realized the extent of that, that battle. Right. When you're in heavy combat, you know what's going on right here in your little sphere, but you don't know the bigger That's right. picture. Yeah. you find out later. I'm uh, Mike Levin. I'm Douglas Dillard. I'm Alfred Chehab. I'm John Schaffner. I was born in a small village in Nebraska. I see you found I'm a product of the aid, the depression period. Infantries, tanks, and smoldering airplane wings. I found myself on the uh, high seas headed for Battle These of the Bulge. These old pictures are cruel. Tell me some stories. Was it like the old war movies? Sit down, son. Let me fill you in. Early morning of the 16th. When the shelling began. Where to begin? To start with the end. This black and white photo from capture the skin. You can see hundreds of Germans. Flash of a gun to a soldier who's done. Trust me, grandson. The war was in color. I got promoted to first sergeant the day before my 19th birthday in, in C Company of the 508 Parachute Regiment. And I had been a bit of an Army brat anyway, so I already made up my mind I was going to make a career in the military. And I did, you know, for 35 years. And uh, I served uh, during the Korean War with a clandestine unit and then in Vietnam with the CIA and, and MACV. I'd always felt. Uh, dedicated to perform my duty. As I look back on this after 70 years and we go in in December to honor the people that were lost, uh, yeah, it brings back a, a lot of memories, but it's a way to uh, you know, honor and pay tribute to the people that didn't come back. Well, I, I uh, always have had the feeling that I'm proud that I did my part. Uh, towards maintaining the freedom of the American people. It was a, it was a great thing we, we all had to do. I'm proud we did it. When I got out of the Army, I went looking for a job, and nobody needed any field artillery <laughs> forward observers. I said, come on, I'm well experienced. No forward observers needed. All I can think about is uh, I wanted to get a job and, ch and chase skirts. Wanted to get a car. I, I didn't talk about the war until 1986, 40 years later. And that was when I went to my first reunion. That, all that period in between, it was, it was all behind me. I, I, yeah. I, my friends that I associated with, I knew had no idea what I went through. Oh, I stayed in. We never talked about it. Uh, we had other things on our mind. This business of being a hero. I'm not a hero. I was a person that, that enjoyed the Army all the way through, the bad times and the good times. I also felt that if I wanted to be able to live free when war broke out, there was no question. You had to fight, and that's what I did. 
I didn't hear the term greatest generation for a long time. Right. And, and uh, I never considered myself as any, anybody special. I've always uh, resented the, the term the greatest generation because yeah. I'm an amateur historian. I did a lot of research at the archives, the Holocaust Museum, and veterans activities. I fought in two, in two other wars. And what are we, chopped liver from Korea, yeah. or Vietnam, or Afghanistan? And my feeling is that that phrase ought to be changed to say the generation of great warriors. Because uh, these guys, even as speak today, some of them are still in harm's way. They do the job just as we did, uh, but I really, if someone comes up to me and says, are you the, a member of the greatest generation, I'd rather say, are you a World War II veteran? It means more to me than being categorized in a group, and I just kind of refute it. Yeah, yeah. does me too.